So let me introduce Michael Schmucki from uh, OpenGIS. Um, so he is going to talk about uh, some really exciting new developments with QGIS running in your browser. So Michael, let's start. Thanks, Martin, and good morning, everyone. Welcome to the talk, QGIS, JS, QGIS core ported to WebAssembly to run it in the browser. Here is what I'm going to show you. And what you see on the map is where we already have talked about the project. So we first announced it at the FOSS GIS in Hamburg. Then Sober talked about it in Tartu at uh, FOSS4G Europe. And now you, this is the first, at uh, the third time we announce it. And I'm very pleased to announce it to the QGS enthusiasts here. Um, what you see here is actually QGIS running in my browser. So that's a whole QGIS that uh, creates this map dynamically. Uh, the project started a year ago at the last user conference where Martin, I don't know, we went out, but uh, Martin Dobias, uh, Andreas Neumann, and me teamed up to make this whole thing uh, possible. Martin had a working prototype of QGIS running in the browser, and I did a lot of WebAssembly web stuff back then. And uh, Andreas Neumann knew that he will join ETH Zurich. And uh, like his vision or, or his goal for the Atlas of Switzerland was to bring it into the browser. And so we, so, so we said, let's make this possible. What, what do we have to do? How we can make this work? And ETH founded uh, our feasibility study where we were able to make a working prototype of this whole thing. This was in summer and fall last year. And in this spring, we, like, there was a small project where we were able to cut the rendering time in half and implement something that is called progressive rendering, where the map loads or builds up dynamically as you know it from your desktop QGIS. So what is QGIS JS? As I said, it's the, the, the core of, of QGIS ported to WebAssembly so JavaScript runtimes can execute it. For the end user, you have a JavaScript API with TypeScript types, as you know it for, from open layers, for example. And you could do basic things with it, like loading a project and then saying, OK, render me a, an image of this project in this projection. Uh, I want this extent in that resolution, and you get a roster image out of it. You can interact with the project so that you can enable, disable layers, play with opacity, and what's really powerful is that you can apply map themes, which will change the whole layer tree at once. Then we thought a lot about how we should implement the user interface or the user experience for that whole thing. And we decided we don't come up with our own system. We reuse what's already there. So our user interface is based on open layers. And basically, we just ship another vector source, another layer source for open layers, where you can integrate QGIS very easily with open layers. But then we don't have to implement our own zooming, panning. That's already sorted out perfectly by open layers. Then what is QGIS JS not? Like it's not a one-to-one -one port from the desktop QGIS you know. So there is no Qt-based uh, GUI in it, no price processing, no 3D support, no Python support. It's really just the core to render maps. Although all those things are technically, technically actually possible, but not in the scope of our project. So we try to keep it small, or we hope we can make it even smaller and not build up everything in it that you know from the desktop. Here you see. Uh, how this feels like for a JavaScript developer. So first you import the library, then you have to 
boot the runtime. This takes a bit of time, so it's an asynchronous function. And then you uh, get back a handle to the file system of that runtime, and you get back an API where you can interact with QJS. So here you see a minimal example where like some geometry operations are done. And here I have to say like the API, ser API service is very limited at the moment. What we can do is the thing you see on the bottom, like load me this QGIS project, uh, then you tell the API, like QGIS actually load the project and then you can render images out of it. And you can do whatever you want with that roster image you get, you can display it in your HTML, or you go with the open layers integration which uh, gives you a full uh, zoomable, pannable map. Uh, WebAssembly, like a short introduction, you can imagine it like a virtual processor architecture. It defines its own instruction set and an own bytecode, and then you can use languages like C, C++, Rust, and combi compile that to this virtual processor. Uh, this bytecode that comes out of the compilation can then be run by a WebAssembly runtime. And uh, the design goals of WebAssembly were to have this uh, compilation target, as I said, that it should be fast, the representation of the bytecode should be compact, and it has a very easy or like a very simple linear memory model, so it's not that hard to actually implement the WebAssembly runtime. And this has been done in all major browsers, so this is out there, everybody can use it. It's even working on mobile, and it's also working on Node, and Deno or like other JavaScript runtimes. Then as we know it from JavaScript, the whole thing is sandboxed. So when you go to a website, you're actually executing code from that website on your machine, but the website cannot access your file system or hardware. And, and it's the same with WebAssembly. So it's really safe to go on a website and execute the C++ code because the sandbox doesn't allow any dangerous access to your system. Then WebAssembly is also gaining traction outside of the browser because this uh, security, sandboxing, but also its portability, um, it's really interesting for doing plug-in systems, for example, or it's also gaining traction in the whole cloud computing ecosystem. But that's not where I'm the expert, and it's not the scope of QGIS, JS. I just wanted to mention it. All right, so what we do technically, uh, we have a bit of C++ code that uh, tells QGIS how to boot and does some configuration. It also defines the API that is available on the JavaScript side. But the, the big part of it is actually the QGIS core plus the whole dependency tree behind or that QGIS needs to run like GDAL and Qt and Proch and SQLite and so on. So like it's a big tree of dependencies. And most of them we could just uh, compile with mscript into WebAssembly and others like GDAL and especially QGIS, we had to do some heavy patching to make this whole thing work. At the moment, those patches are in our project, so it's just a patch file, but we are thinking about how we could upstream those changes back to the QGIS core project. So yeah, this whole C++, code base uh, gets cross-compiled with mscripten, and what comes out in the end is a .wasm file, which is really the bytecode. It's about 40 megabytes at the moment, so we hope we can make this smaller, but like, it's working. If you have a good internet connection, this is fine for the moment. It has a data file, which includes projection databases and like other files. Uh, QGIS needs to run, and some JavaScript code that gets generated by mscript. We wrap this whole thing uh, with some JavaScript code that, or actually TypeScript code that we wrote to have, like, to have really a nice API for the end user. And this together gets shipped as an NPM package and can be downloaded from every JavaScript developer and be used as is. Now I want to, sh to show some features and like I 
would love to update the map for Bratislava, but there was no time. But since I live in Hamburg, Hamburg is still a good fit. And the first thing I want to mention is the vector capability. So you can open up all the vector formats that QJS uh, can load. So GeoJSON, GeoPackage, shapefiles, and uh, the list goes on. And uh, you can symbolize them as we all know and love from QJS. So you can go crazy with expressions and do really nice symbolization that are created dynamically in the browser. So there's no pre-tiling, there's no server involved. It's really happening on, in my machine on my browser. Then you could do the same thing with rosters. So every roster format GTL can read. You can also read it with QGIS.js. And you can do the same thing as QGIS can, like blending and also stuff like hill shading. Yeah. The same thing with labeling, you can use the great labeling engine from QJS. So you can do much more intelligent label placement and bending and stuff like the other JavaScript based map renders cannot do. Um, you could also have uh, complex rules defining how the labels overlay or, or compete with each other. Yeah. As, as you all know from the desktop QJS. Then you can also use the diagrams that uh, QGIS can create, and you can create them dynamically based on, on the data you load in the layers. That was really important for the Atlas of Switzerland project. And I think it just landed in QGIS that we got an update with new diagram types and, and new options how you can do diagrams with it. All right, then I want to do a quick demo. Um, what you see here, maybe I make this small. This is the, the tiny demo website of the project. You find it on GitHub pages, and when you load it, when you load it, you get a really simple project loading up here. Uh, you can integrate, you can interact with the layers, like you can toggle them, you can play with the visibility, and you can uh, load up uh, another. QJS project. Now it has to fetch it from the network. It doesn't take too long. Let me try again. Okay. Oh, now it's here. Um, like this is a really simple geo package that contains the boundaries of all countries and like the many municipalities in it. And uh, there is another layer using the same geo package with an expression that does some random coloring. And what I also can show is the, the map theme. So when I say grayscale, it selects the set of those two layers. And then if I say funky, it selects only the funky layer. What you also can do is open up a local QGIS project. So if I hit that button here, I can actually select the folder on my system. And let's use a bit more complex map. Like this is really doing roster, uh, like uh, roster sh shading and has some complex symbology, how the map looks on different zoom levels. You can also select uh, different points in time. Yes, and maybe another example. This is a town in Switzerland, and the data comes from the solar catester. It has some uh, roster base map in it, and it has this, uh, I don't know the term, but uh, you see that the boundary of the geometry does this shading effect on the base map. And like, I think you all know what's possible with QGIS, and the thing I want to tell you is like, you can use all of that and make it run in the browser without any server. 
involved. Okay, and that's also like the, the potential of this whole project. Like you can do dynamic visualizations that are just not possible with other solutions. And then, as I said, you don't need a server, so you can you don't have any server maintenance, you don't have any server costs. You can really sh uh, do the work on the client machine. And it's also nice that the user actually can add data from their own machine without uploading it to a server. So in terms of privacy, security, this, this is a nice thing. Um, it has huge potential if we increase the API service surface of this whole thing. So like my goal is to that you can actually in JavaScript create a new project, add a layer and, and programmatically create your own projects via JavaScript. But that's not possible at the moment. And all, as I said, it would also be technically possible to bring Python in it to add the Qt GUI. But at the moment, it's not our scope. If somebody wants to tackle those problems, like feel free, we are happy to see some experiments. Uh, the limitations at the moment is that we cannot load uh, network layers. Like This is not impossible, it's just not uh, working yet. But you could still use uh, cloud-optimized GeoTIFF from open layers as a base map, and then you render on top the, the vector layers with QGIS, JS. So it's, it's kind of okay for the moment, but we are working on that one, and we hope we can give an update next year. And also, like some stuff that is not implemented yet, it's also uh, totally possible to do that, but not yet in our prototype. Then, like a disclaimer, we released this work under a GPL license because it has GPL code in it. So we are like porting the QJS code base and also Geos and Qt. So this is GPL based software, so our product has to be GPL2. And we don't really know the implication for somebody who builds a website and uses QJS, JS to display a map on it. it. Has to be the whole website released under GPL? Or is this totally okay as it would be if you're running QJS on the server? So we hope we can make a, a clear statement someday, but we simply cannot do at the moment, so be cautious about licensing. This is what we want to tackle next. So we want to make the networks layer uh, working with QGIS.js, and we want to increase the, the API so that you can do dynamic projects, dynamic layers, as I said earlier. And also what's really missing at this point is that you cannot really click on, on individual features. That's also something we want to implement soonish. And yeah, feel free, like if you're interested in the project, feel free to join. It's all hosted on GitHub. We are just, we are also just happy if you tried to check out the code base and compile it on your system so you make sure it's, it's reproducible. And if you want to increase the API service, we would be very, very happy. Yeah, I think this is it, like the website that I showed earlier, code is on GitHub, you find the JavaScript package on NPM, and if you want to play around with this interactive slideshow, this is also on GitHub. And tomorrow morning at nine o'clock, I will be giving a workshop about QGIS.js, so how you, can, how you can use this project to create a simple website symbolizing QGIS maps in your privacy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. So, uh, questions? And also, like, Martin did a lot of the work, so it was a joint of, uh, effort of the two of us, so thank you to him. <clears throat> Thank you. I have a question about the coordinate systems. If you want to use, like, for example, Arctic Polar stereographic uh, coordination system, is it? Is Sorry, I, I, I didn't. Uh, is it possible to use different coordinate systems? 
Yeah, 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 that's totally possible. Like, Proch is, is behind the whole stack, and you can use any coordinate system okay. in the world. Great, thanks. Also, it's also supported by open layers. So you can really, like, also, it's not that you have to convert it to display it in open layers. It's really open layers can do that too, and you can use any coordinate system. All right, some more questions. Uh, I have a question. When are we going to get uh, QGIS running fully in the browser? <laughs> like the, the full desktop experience. I don't like the idea to have this sandboxed environment to run my big models and my big compute, like my big processing pipelines in this uh, like kind of small processor architecture. So if I do real heavy work in QGIS, I always want the compile version from my system. But yeah, there are use cases for demos or workshops or people that are not allowed to install QGIS where it would be really, really cool to have that. But uh, let's sort out the important stuff before and then we can play around with Python and, and what's needed besides the, the core. All right, okay. Yeah, another question? Is there some kind of caching or something, or does it always re-render re the map view once the view is moved? Like, open layers does the intelligence as it does with uh, WMS. Like there, there is cache. Like open layers does caching, and of course, it, also those 30, 40 megabytes of WebAssembly you download, you don't have to download this ever, ever again. So you you can store that. Uh, in the cache of the browser. Yeah. Also, QGIS has its internal caching mechanism. I tried this out uh, in this performance project context, but it didn't help much. So maybe we enable it at some point, but at the moment, caching is up to the browser and open layers. All right. Some more questions? Hi, I'm Walter. Thank you for a nice presentation. And I'm not a front-end developer, so I think uh, I'm making a stupid uh, question. But uh, if you want to, to make a production, uh, your da data and project uh, must be available by web. They must be available somewhere on a so web, web server so that the website okay. can download it and load it into the runtime. Yeah. But if you're thinking about uh, only the use case where the user uploads project, so you, then you don't have to host nothing of the project and the data on a server. Okay. But yeah, to, to ship it to the browser, to the client, it has to be somewhere. Okay, thank you. And you, you could think about obfuscating the data, but in the end, it has to be downloadable by the client. So okay. yeah, you, you have to upload it somewhere. Thank you. All right, I think we have a possibility for one more question, if there is any. Uh, so about the security then, uh, so the clients have access to all the data that I put on the server, like your packages and stuff like that. So they can, download the full file and I mean of they course. have to do yeah yeah okay they they will the web browser will do it for them of course but if they like want they will be able to download it the they source file they can always open up the, the yeah. developer console yeah, 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 and see which yeah. files are requested but you have to request the yeah. file from somewhere to to load it and otherwise, you have to go for the local file system access, where the user just grants permission to one folder that he selects, and then you can render the, the project from there. Yeah. So basically, we are giving the files on the web to be accessible to all. Yes. So OK. Yes. That's a different approach, because with the web server, technology, yeah, you, you, yeah, don't, yeah. you can you actually don't hide it from the user. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And you can uh, limit the editing functionality just to read only and stuff like that. So, okay, that's uh, but it's it is still very very uh, interesting stuff. So. Thanks. All right, I think uh, that's it uh, for questions. So we have a 
Small present for you, Michael. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope to see some of you tomorrow, 9 o'clock in the workshop. Thank you very much.